welcome to POTUS 2016, where we call the presidential horse race and pour cold hard facts on the overheated campaign rhetoric. I'm Brian Lehrer. Today, beyond the New York primary, which saw big wins for Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, where Bernie Sanders' winning streak hit a wall, where John Kasich won just a handful of delegates and Ted Cruz won none at all. But they all march on. Also on the broadcast, we'll take a crash course in what ought to be a bigger campaign issue, education. Labor leader Randy Weingarten, president of the American Federation of Teachers, will be here. And in our evidence-based politics segment, we'll examine a new study questioning the longevity of urban charter schools. Are they bubbles like subprime mortgages? But first, the photo free finishes. Yes, time for the horse race. With Donald Trump's huge 60% win in New York, it becomes all but impossible for Ted Cruz to win the 1,237 delegates needed to secure the nomination before the convention. And for Trump, the wide margin couldn't have come at a better time, as his campaign recovers from a double-digit statewide loss in Wisconsin and a delegate shutout at Colorado's state convention. Trump also used the last two weeks of Republican primary downtime to restructure his ground campaign. And he has toned down the rhetoric a bit. In New York, he had lower negative ratings than in previous contests. 24% said they wouldn't vote for him if he were the nominee, while 27% said they would avoid Kasich. And a whopping 41% of Republican primary voters said that they wouldn't vote for Cruz. But Cruz moves on. In advance of their primary next Tuesday, Cruz spent the night of his third place New York finish in Pennsylvania, which votes next week. 54 of that state's 71 delegates to the Republican National Convention, however, will be unbound to any candidate on a first convention ballot. And that's the good news for Cruz. Upcoming are more urban and blue states that are not so favorable to him. Also hindering his path is the former reality TV star's continuing home screen advantage with the major media outlets. According to Media Watchdog, the Media Research Center, from March 21st to April 15th, Trump and his staff racked up 60 percent more airtime, seen here in yellow, on Fox, CNN, and MSNBC than the Cruz campaign. On to the Democratic side. For Hillary, Tuesday, there was indeed no place like home. She won 58 percent statewide and 63 percent of New York City voters, racking up commanding wins among affluent and non-white voters. She won 57 percent of female voters overall in the city, 59 percent of single women, 70 percent of older voters, and 71 percent of African Americans. Predictably, Bernie Sanders connected with younger voters, 72 to 28 percent. Bernie's numbers would likely have been stronger overall, but independent voters were shut out of the New York primary. To switch to a Democratic registration, Bernie voters would have had to re-register as Democrats 27 weeks before the primary. Now, the upcoming primaries in Connecticut, Maryland, and Pennsylvania will also be closed to independent voters. Sanders now has little chance of winning the required pledge delegates before Clinton does. He would need to beat her by an average of 18 points in all of the remaining races. But the Sanders campaign soldiers on. Nationally, polling numbers indicate that he is still closing in on Hillary popularity-wise. He hopes that might convince some of Clinton's 502 superdelegates of his electability. But the betting market says we don't think that's a likely scenario. Microsoft Research Project's PredictWise which factors in real money wagering on the race, now places Hillary's chances of getting to and winning the general election at 72 percent. Democrats as a party are predicted to have a 75 percent chance of winning the White House, shown by that top red line as Republican chances decline. To get a sense of what New York City voters were thinking Tuesday, we visited a diverse upper Manhattan neighborhood called Washington Heights North, a Democratic stronghold. The 12,000 Democrats who voted there went for Clinton over Sanders more than two to one. But while we found few real enthusiasts for her and many for Bernie, lots of voters told us their choice was strategic. I voted for Hillary. And what was your central reason? I want to win, and I think she's our best shot at winning. The central reason that I voted for Bernie is that um, I think 
the primary election is an opportunity to vote like specifically for somebody I believe in as opposed to for somebody that I think will beat the candidate that I don't want to win. He's talking about health care. He's talking about hiring wages, making the wages higher than what they were. And then for some reason, Bernie seemed like an honest person. Because I want to keep the uh, pressure on Hillary because I don't trust her. And so I want to keep the pressure from the left. For Hillary. For Hillary. Why? I like him. Yeah. yeah. Good. He's a very friend for the, for the Spanish people. She's good for the Spanish people. Yeah, for the Spanish people. Uh, I think for the first time in a long time, I actually had a very hard time making a final decision. So it was a little bit like uh, ordering at a diner. <laughs> I put my vote in and then thought, hmm, maybe I should have done something else. Um, so where, how'd you finally fall? Uh, well, I, I think I decided that um, the, what I'm grappling with personally right now are women's issues, so I voted for Hillary. Oh, I, wish, I wish I could have voted for her as a woman, but I feel she's too much part of the establishment. Monica. People haven't forgotten Monica. Well, why take it out on her, though? Yeah, but not, not take it. Well, people affiliate people with each other. You know, association brings on what? So, Bernie, why shouldn't we vote for you? Uh, well, it, because I support the 99%. And uh, let me see, what else? Yeah, I'm going to raise the, I want to raise the minimum wage to 15 bucks. 15 bucks nationally. Whoever the nominee for the Democratic Party is, is going to be highly qualified. This has been a tough primary because it's two really great candidates. Those were a few of the 12,000 Democrats to vote in that district. Only 460 Republicans voted in that northern Manhattan neighborhood. And Donald Trump did not win a majority. All right, joining us to discuss the New York primary results and the candidates' ideas for both labor and education is Randy Weingarten, president of the American Federation of Teachers, an AFL-CIO affiliate representing 1.6 million members. Welcome. It's great to be with you. So I hear you were out in Brooklyn on Tuesday I getting was... votes for <laughs> Hillary Clinton. So I spent a bunch of time in the last few days out and about, um, which is always great to be in New York like that. Um, but I was, um, Tuesday afternoon, I was in Brooklyn by Borough Hall, and a couple of things were really interesting to me. One, it's like old home week for me. So, you know, all of a sudden you, people see you and they want to talk about education for and they want to talk who, about labor. Who, who don't know, you right. were the union president for New York State teaching for New York UFT City. Uh, for New York City. And then you went on to lead the national union. Exactly. So, and I was, and so I've worked in New York City, you know, for about 25 years before I started leading the national and in, in union work. So you got all of that in terms of street action in, in New York and in Brooklyn, which, you know, it's just different. Um, but what, two things I saw, which is really important. Number one, people were jazzed that New York mattered. And, and you felt that. And, you know, people were saying, oh, I'm going on, I'm on my way to vote. No, I voted this morning. A lot of people were wearing their stickers, which people never used to wear in New York. People were wearing their stickers all the time. It's been a long time um, since New York had a primary that mattered because it comes late in the it game. It kind of comes late in the game. And it never matters in the general election because well, it's it, so reliably blue. Because of, because, and, and, well, it hasn't mattered in the general election for a long time. But, you know, McGovern lost New York. Um, many, many years ago. Um, but it really mattered, and people were very thoughtful about it. And, and, and the, those, when I was handing out the Hillary literature, you know, those who actually, people who voted, there was a seriousness about it and a real sense of we're going to do our civic duty, and I love that. Did you find, in your talking to voters and hearing that some were for one and some were for the other, that besides being jazzed, that they started to feel more negatively about the other one because we had a more rough and tumble campaign, I think, in New York than Clinton and Sanders had had elsewhere. Um, I, I, didn't see, I didn't see it in the discussions on the street in Brooklyn, um, which was very much a pro-Hillary crowd. Um, even, you know, even the Bernie folks would say, you know, we have two good candidates. 
But I did see it throughout the rest of the state campaigning. I was in Westchester on Sunday. I was in Rockland County, where I grew up, on Saturday. Northern suburbs and of the city. Thank you. And people were, people are disturbed about the level of acrimony. Not everyone. I mean, you have some passionate, like last night at Hillary's party, the love in the room was remarkable. And I think it even people on, who watched on TV even saw that this was not a strategic decision by the people in that room. There's real love for Hillary Clinton. I think what you see, though, is that Bernie's, um, you know, Bernie's campaign, which has endeared many to him because it was positive about the issues, both on the democracy side and on the economic side. People are disturbed that it became so negative, and particularly in a place like New York, where people know Hillary. I mean, whether you like her or not, she is the most qualified candidate running for president, certainly in my lifetime. And the constant character assaults against someone who is pretty tireless about fighting for women and children was disturbing to a lot of people. And frankly, in retrospect, I think that widened her margin because the margin was wider than I think any expectation about how much she would win New York. I know that I heard from people on both sides of the Democratic primary divide who started to feel more negative about the other candidate, the one yes. they were not for as the last uh, two weeks went on. But the Bernie supporters would say, look, it was always issue oriented. If it was about taking money from Goldman Sachs or not releasing the transcripts of the speeches, that she gave for that money, that's issue oriented. That's nothing like what the Republicans have been doing about people's wives and the size of their hands and all that other stuff. Well, look, I wouldn't actually use the Republican debate right now as any kind of standard um, one way or the other. I think that when, at the moment in the debate in New York, so I've, I've sat through three, I've, I've listened to in the audience, three of the Democratic debates. I've been really honored to be um, involved throughout this whole process. There was none of the catcalling in the other debates. It, this debate was stadium-like, and CNN at one point or another had to say to the audience, stop it. Um, there was none of that in the other debates. I think in the debate, when the moderators asked Bernie and said, could you give us one example of the basis of this, of, of, of saying that, that, that her vote has changed because of a donation. And at that moment, when he couldn't, while she was on stage to be able to respond, that should have been the end of the character assassination about whether she was, about whether somebody was, with, whether they were buying her votes. That's what I think the Hillary supporters have been so offended by, um, as well as, when you call somebody a whore, when you throw money at them in a motor court. Bernie didn't do that. No, Some no, no. people on the street did that. At, when, when, when at the rally in, in, um, at NYU, when he was introduced that way, um, or when he was introduced by someone who oh, someone used that the, term. on the stage did that. Um, Paul Song used that term. Didn't say Hillary's name, but used that term, and then the next couple of days throwing money at the motorcade. I think that's why people were upset. Having said that, most importantly is to unite our party. And I was very pleased that she, at the beginning of her speech yesterday, said to the Bernie supporters, there is more that unites us than divides us. Because that, there, there is an amazing um, vi vitality towards the young, towards millennials um, resonance with Bernie. And that is something that all of us not only have to take key to, but really need to embrace. Well, certainly if she's on the verge of vanquishing him, then she's reaching out to his voters and hoping that they'll come out for her in November. And there was a very encouraging statistic from the New York exit polls, which showed that less than 15 percent yes. of Sanders supporters said no way they would vote for Hillary Absolutely. in November. I want to go into education and, and, issues. And let me just say one more thing, which is that he, the issues that he has raised, I like Bernie, the issues that he has raised in terms of the economic inequality in this country, they're real issues. 
but the ultimate, um, our ultimate need is not just to raise them, but to address them and solve them. Common Core. <laughs> Big punching bag in this campaign from the left and the right. right. From the left because of standardized tests, from the right because they think federal control of education makes it too liberal. Right. What's the union's position on Common Core? So we have always been in favor of higher standards, meaning a set of standards that are aligned to what kids need to know and be able to do in the 21st century. And that's what the promise of Common Core was supposed to be. But what has happened is the promise and the reality have not been the same. And I call them a lot Common Core test or Common Core testing. The right wing was completely wrong in the way in which it's politicized this. But there's always a kernel of truth, and that kernel of truth was that the Obama administration used race to the top and the grants that states got and said, and dangled money in front of states in the period of a recession and said, you'll get this money right. if you um, close schools and have charters, if you implement Common Core, um, and if you um, use testing to evaluate teachers. Right, and that's the Obama policy. Yeah. So has Obama been, in effect, a Republican on this issue, as far as you're concerned? Well, Obama, I think, has been on this issue, and he and I have had many a conversation. Um, I think they um, were misguided on this. I think they focused too much on testing and sanctioning, as opposed to on how to solve the problems of public education by supporting um, kids and improving instruction and dealing with the other issues that affect kids. Because Brian, these days nationally, 50% of our kids in public schools are poor. But what you have to, you have to give great credit to Obama, to the president, because within the span of these eight years, there has been a recognition that their first impulse was wrong. And he's done a mea culpa about testing, and he also signed the new education law that creates the reset that includes prohibiting the federal government from, from requiring tests as the basis of teacher evaluation and prohibiting the federal government from imposing standards. So there's been a real shift in the president based upon looking at the evidence. Stay there because we are going to bring on some additional evidence right, right now. Time for evidence-based politics, where we pour cold, hard facts on the overheated campaign rhetoric. Charter schools, a hot issue that ought to get more attention on the campaign trail. These public-private hybrid schools first appeared in the early 90s. They are no longer fringe. More than 6,000 charters enroll 6% 6 of all public school students. Charter schools are run as private entities, but are funded by the public. Supporters say charters allow innovation and often outshine their public school counterparts on standardized tests, graduation rates, and college enrollment. Opponents argue that they do not do so and use public school space and funds without the same level of oversight. The issue doesn't fall so easily on the political spectrum. President Obama has been a big supporter of charters, as we've just been hearing, channeling millions of federal dollars to the schools. In our current race, all candidates support charters, with Bernie Sanders a bit more cautious, saying they should be held to the same standards as regular public schools. Bernie would oppose them even more if he thought charters operated like the mortgage banking system prior to the financial crisis. I'm not making a joke. Charter schools and big banks are an odd comparison, but that's just how one provocative new study framed the proliferation of charters in recent years. The study fears a charter school bubble. Here to explain via Skype is Preston Green, professor of urban education and educational leadership and law at the University of Connecticut. Professor, welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me. What does that mean, a charter school bubble? When we were thinking about this issue, we had noted that over the years, um, charters were about to really blow up. And 
Mark Nyson, who is a professor of urban education at New York, had posited that there may be a charter school bubble similar to that of the subprime mortgage crisis. And what he said was that some of the issues that we're seeing in charter schools with respect to fraud and mismanagement and also student uh, discipline issues had, were, were very similar to what we're seeing in, subprime, in the subprime mortgage crisis. Is that to say that it's a matter of proliferation? That is, there's so much pressure to grant more charters and there are so many people trying to get into the charter school game um, that like the old subprime mortgages that didn't have enough standards for the borrowers. There aren't the standards uh, that these folks are being held to before they open these schools. Yes, that is exactly correct. What we found in our research is that there's this movement to expand the number of charter schools by removing the possible restrictions. And so the removal of those restrictions may result in a proliferation of charter schools similar to the proliferation of mortgages that we saw with possible dire consequences. So then taking the bubble model to its conclusion, there would then be a collapse because there were so many weak charter schools. Do you have data in your study to indicate that there are many weak charter schools on the scene now? We do have data to support that um, provocative claim. In fact, the Stanford Credo study in 2009 uh, raised the issue of multiple authorizers, which was one of the issues that we discussed in our report. And what the Credo study found was that um, charter schools in states with multiple authorizers um, were n had a negative correlation with um, academic performance, academic growth. When you say multiple authorizers, does that mean that more than one agency, like either a city education department or the state, has the authority to authorize a charter school? Is that what you're referring to with that? That is what we're referring to. It's important to understand that uh, school districts are the primary authorizer. 90% um, of authorizers are school districts. And people who promote charter school growth point out that school districts are very hesitant to authorize charter schools. Uh, there's an average of five or fewer. And so they're calling for universities, nonprofits, entities that are um, not uh, reliant or concerned with school districts to uh, issue, uh, issue charters. Randy Weingarten, does this study, if it proves to really be predicting that something that's going to come to fruition. I think he's just seeing the beginning of what might be indicators of a bubble. This would prove what you've been saying all along? I, first off, I think the study is really interesting. Um, but we're seeing evidence of this in several big urban areas. So you have um, the Broad, you have Eli Broad, who has tried to bankrupt the LA system by um, proposing that half the schools in L.A. become charters. You've seen this experience in Philadelphia, in Chicago, and in Detroit, and in Philly and in Detroit right now, where you have the mayors in both of these places um, seeking to halt the rapid growth. There's been tremendous pushback at both of them because what it's done is it's really bankrupting the public system um, and what and, and what and what um, the professor has said is is totally true. There's no accountability or very little accountability and very little transparency. So there's no checks and balance against the waste and the fraud. Professor, give us your best example. Is there a city or a school district in which charters collapsed after being approved too easily by the secondary authorizers? I think um, what. I'll answer this by saying what really um, caused us to look into the study. And this was, um, I was a, I helped out with a Detroit Free Press examination of Detroit charter schools. And what they found was instances of fraud and mismanagement, um, instances of students being mistreated. And a big issue was that uh, there were a number of authorizers that were universities, entities that were not connected with school districts that were providing uh, these schools. And so these instances of issues that we found was what prompted the study. 
Since then, since we've done this study, I have been contacted by a number of people um, in school districts who have said that they have experienced many of the issues that we discussed in our report. So while you're not seeing, we're really at the ground zero for these, for these issues. Very interesting. I, and Professor, I'm going to leave it there as we run out of time. Thank you very much for sharing your research with us. And Randy Weingarten from the American Federation of Teachers. Um, Hillary Clinton softened her position on charter schools in this campaign. She used to be a more vocal supporter of charter schools. Your union gave her your endorsement way back last July, and then there was a speech in November that she gave in South Carolina where the media first really noticed um, that she was you know, um, articulating cautionary mm -hmm. statements about charter schools. Did you make a deal? I'd prefer to look at it as you just look at the evidence. And when you have real conversations with people, and she's very smart about school issues, she knows them well, and you put the evidence in front of people, it's pretty unmistakable that charters have to be held to the same standards as other public schools. They take public dollars. Remember, Al Shanker, one of my predecessors at the AFT and UFT, was one of the first people to propose charters. But he proposed them as a way of really breaking up the, the, the bu bureaucratic um, uh, stranglehold that bureaucracies had and said, let parents and teachers try to do something new. So she's actually now saying that charters have to take the same kits. They can't supplant public school systems, and they have to be held to the same standards. So in our remaining 15 seconds, really 15 seconds, what can a president do about that? We think of this as a local education issue. Well, first, under the new ed law um, that was signed this year that basically resets federal education policy, it has to hold, it is holding charters more accountable, and it needs to. But most importantly, we need to really invest in other public schools, Thank real you very public much. schools. And that's POTUS 2016 for today. We're here each week calling the presidential horse race and pouring cold hard facts on the overheated campaign rhetoric. Next week, primaries in Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for watching.